listening to Second Wind with Joyce Buford, where women who are ready to expand their life adventure discover the tools to stop playing small and tap into the courage required to enjoy their Second Wind. Welcome. Welcome to Second Wind. It is a thrill to have you out there today, and I think you're going to really love this show. Now, let me remind you that Second Wind is a podcast made just for you. It's to encourage you to play full out, to make the most of every day, and to get to know who you really are, not who was put into your little mind when you were five or six or three or two, but who you really are. I want to inspire you to dream big. We, we really dumb down us too much. And I really want you to think of the possibilities that are out there waiting for you to take. And number three, I wanted to inform you how to get your second win with success and fulfillment as you go through life. You know, my, all of my guests are women who have gone through their own transitions, found their own stories, and are living them better today than they were before their transition moment or change in life. So another thing I like to preach on this podcast is you must be connected and you must find support to help you through your journal journey. So thanks for being here, and I'm going to tell you about our show. Now, Rachel Hessling Hessling has been with us before, and we had such a good time, and she's just so amazing in her her knowledge and her growth that I just had to have her back. And so she said, yes, so we're here today. I wish you could see her. I could see her because I, I've got Zoom on, but you can't. I'm sorry. You can just listen to us. But she's got the best smile in all of California. I know. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Rachel. Rachel has been immersed in the study of psychology for over 40 years. Her father, a clinical psychologist, taught his children his craft, such as such that Rachel was first introduced to neuro-linguistic programming, shortened by NLP, those concepts when she was nine years old, and she has been performing parts work and refining her reframing skills since she was 11 years old. So I'd say she's had a lot of practice. After receiving her first, her own bachelor's degree in so social psychology from UCLA. Rachel facilitated trainings for the Southern California Society of Ericksonian Psychotherapy and Hypnosis. Yes, that's a mouthful. It is, (laughs) yes. Helping teach therapists how to incorporate storytelling techniques in a clinical setting. Now, Rachel has directed exhibitors on on a, a huge conference for women. She's I mean, she's coached for so many years. I mean, Rachel, this is so hard. Your list is just magnificent. (laughs) I love it. Our accomplishments. Yeah. So Rachel currently is the author of two books, Navigating Life, Eight Different Strategies to Guide Your Way, and The Rituals of Release, How to Make Room for Your New Life. Her work is through her company, The Fullness of of Your Power helps people feel like they are their own worst enemy. <laughs> I think you misread that. I did it. Well, what is, okay, what did I say? Okay, you, you said my, my work makes people feel like their own worst enemy. I was like, oh, I sincerely hope not. <laughs> oh, okay, let me try that. You're funny. Okay, I work with people, people who already feel that way. Oh, okay. Make friends with themselves. <laughs> okay, that sounds much better. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't mean to be so wordy when I sent you my intro. <laughs> oh, well, you know, honestly, it's really kind of hard sometimes in writing a bio when you do have somebody that has just really produced most of her life. I mean, because it's all awesome and it's all wonderful. So I'm not complaining. <laughs> I just can't read all of it. <laughs> Psychotherapy and all the psycho words seem to get very tongue-tied. I get very tongue-tied with them. Yeah. So. Well, I, th I think the bottom line is I've been doing, I've been absolutely fascinated by people and why they do the things they do for a very, very long time. Yes. And I'm still fascinated and I'm still learning new things. And I love using what I learn to help other people live the lives they actually want to be living. Yes, yeah, that's a great thing. Now, our focus today is gonna to be on how to strengthen resilience by regularly clearing out the little things that drag us down. So we're gonna talk about that. You're gonna help us over those things because <laughs> we all have those demons inside of us. Oh yeah. Speaking, speaking to us. But anyway, that, that's our main focus to, today. And you didn't, you said transition. I always like to talk about the transition. What was the transition? And you said, I've just been transitioning for most of my life. Yeah, it, someone described the way I look at the world as a kaleidoscopic hologram. Mm -hmm. Because there's part of the way that I look at things that recognizes that each of us can see exactly the same situation in very different ways. Mm -hmm. oh. So, yeah, okay. so it's like one person will say, okay, here's X, Y, and Z, and of X, Y, and Z, it's obvious that X is the most important thing to pay attention to. And okay. someone else can look at the same things and say, actually, I think Y is more important. And when you think Y is more important, it changes your decisions, it changes your feelings about it, it can change your feelings about yourself. Mm -hmm. So when I say I've been through a multitude of transitions, I mean that there are so many times where I'll be blithely going along thinking this is the way life is, and then something happens that makes me question my premise. Well, what if that's not what's going on? Uh, if I have an argument with somebody, what if they actually have a point and I was the one who was wrong? Mm -hmm. What if? So whenever I have one of those type of moments, it makes me stop and kind of reevaluate everything so that I can move forward with a deeper understanding, not just of my world, but other people's experience as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, something that we shared, you shared with me. We were talking about um, people that think totally different from you. And, you know, I would have the tendency just to get really agitated and angry. And you put this out there, which I thought was really pretty good. I'd have to work on it though. I have to yeah. do it. Is that ask instead of emotionally responding to them, that you ask, you, what was it? Well, can you explain that? Or why do you see it that way? Or what was your question you said to me? Yeah, well, it's the concept is curiosity. Yeah. Instead of saying, no, you're wrong, it's okay, hold on. Why? Is it about the situation that makes you feel that way? Yes. Yeah. Those type of questions. Uh, in that situation, if you want to go back to transition points, mm -hmm. I give full credit to my first marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, my first husband and I got married under extenuating circumstances. <laughs> this was overseas in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he was from Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. there was a war going on. You either get married or you never see each other again. This was before the internet. You don't have ways of staying in touch. 
-hmm. So we got married, we came back to the States. We discovered over time that even though we really deeply cared about each other, we were not supposed to be married to each other. Oh. At the point that we realized that was not the type of relationship we were supposed to have, we actually became better friends. Mm -hmm. And because of the, if, if the situation had been different, for example, he was just somebody that I met down the street, we probably would have dated for a while and then gone our separate ways. But because we had made the commitment of marriage, we had stronger ties. Mm -hmm. It gave me an incentive to put in the work to understand who he is. Mm -hmm. yeah. This taught me that just because someone sees the world differently than I do, it does not mean that they are wrong. Yeah. Wow. So that was a huge transition for me. Without that experience, I probably would not be the person I am today mm -hmm. because it taught me that curiosity. It mm -hmm. taught me that desire to understand without necessarily trying to change. Um, did, does that mean that you were open to understanding his past life that created his present life, his decisions? That's part of it. Part of it was discovering people are just, just see the world in different ways. Oh. It's a combination of nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Myers-Briggs typology. It has been grossly misused <laughs> because people... To, people try to shove other people into boxes like, oh, well, yeah. if you answer these questions this way, then obviously you are this type of person and this is who you are. And right. that's not what it was designed for. If you look at the typology and break it down into its component structure, it acknowledges that people have innate tendencies that are different in how they take in, process, and validate information. As an example, when you are given information, do you think about it and then you know, you decide whether or not it's right if you've got a gut sense that, yeah, that, that feels right? Mm -hmm. Or, do you get kind of a gut feeling? And then if you can work it out logically, then you accept that, yes, this is valid. People have genetic tendencies towards one or the other. Hmm. Something that's fascinating, and I'm, I'm going to try not to go too far down the rabbit hole, <laughs> but just looking at statistics, this type of processing validation seems to have a gender bias mm. where uh, speaking in broad general terms, the majority of women validate information by thinking and then validating by gut. Whereas the majority of men may get a gut sense, but they want to figure it out in their head in order to accept that it's correct. Oh. But not, it's not everybody. Mm -hmm. When you run into people who are opposite that, you can get kind of a strange feeling where you get a man who comes across seeming soft, softer than you would think as a general masculine or a woman who seems a little bit harsher. Mm -hmm. And it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with them or they should be one way or another. But just because of statistical averages, we're not used to people validating information in ways that are different from the majority of those who um, have other gender attributes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, as I said, this is a rabbit hole. The, 
the primary reason I'm talking about this is to talk about the nature aspects. People are different. Some people are really goal-oriented. Others are more interested in the process. Okay. I am so process-oriented. I may have mentioned this before. It's surprising I remember to tie my shoes. <laughs> I'm always looking, okay, and this, and then this, and then this. Learning how to complete projects, how to complete things in general is a learned skill, not an innate something that I am drawn to. Oh. Oh. That's one of the reasons why I like Myers-Briggs because I use it to remind myself that not everybody is like me and that's mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So is there, does anybody actually come fully equipped? To be a perfect person? Yes. <laughs> Or to have that structure inside of them, or is well, it, or do they see it in their family growing, or how do they take it in? Well, am I on the right? You path? are. Okay, well, it's if we're discussing the interaction of nature and nurture, uh -huh. you are born with innate tendencies. Uh -huh. You are the then surrounded by other human beings. And when you're really tiny, you're dependent on these human beings. We have those mirror neurons. Mm. We have all of this neurology that we've evolved into that is specifically designed to help us play nicely with others because yeah. we do need others to survive. Yes. The process of learning and growing and living our lives, from my perspective, is increasing our awareness and choice. We look at, here is what other people want. Here is what other people say we should do. Here are things that we want to do, keeping in mind that one of the things that we want to do is make other people happy. We need to learn how to strengthen our connection with our core selves. Yeah. Preferably in a way that also acknowledges and nurtures important relationships. Mm -hmm. These are the situations where we do act differently around different people. We do take other people into consideration because mm -hmm. that's another part of being human. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is figure out how to do these things in a way that is mutually beneficial, that honors ourselves as well as the other person instead of making it an either or. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with the nature versus nurture, Unfortunately, a lot of the nature becomes uh, kind of embedded in us, especially when we learn at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And it become, can become difficult to differentiate what is our core selves versus what have we taken on from others. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of things that I know I have taken on from others that is incredibly useful. I am forever grateful to my mother for teaching me how to organize stuff <laughs> and categories and how do you find things. This is not something which I was innately born with, Why? but it's incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. yep. So not everything that we take on is negative. Right. We just need to pay attention to, I guess, our inner guidance. Mm -hmm. What is constricting? What makes us feel smaller? What folds us in on ourselves? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that we want to learn how to let go of so right. that we can become more expansive mm -hmm. so that the things that we take on from others increase our ability to be more 
of who we want to be. Right. Yeah, is that why when we get older, we sit back and we look and we say, I'm looking more and more like my mother every day. (laughs) (laughs) I sound like my mother. I really do. I have to tell you one of the good things that I got from my mother, definitely, is that she displayed resilience Mm. in her life. She had some hiccups, you know, some challenges. And she was the most resilient woman I have ever seen. And if anything, I think I got my resilience my from her. I mean, yeah. her attitude toward uh, difficulty. I mean, she never let it stop her. It was, I mean, she did pretty good. She lived to be 99 years old. Oh, my. So she wasn't totally there at 99, but she had had a long life. But I just, that's the one gift I can easily say she gave me. And I just watched her, you know? Yeah. Just watched her. What did she do that you noticed in becoming more resilient? Well, when times got hard for her, uh, finances got limited. Um, There was no job that she wouldn't go out and take. There was, she had to work, so she went out and got a job. (laughs) It was a job I wouldn't have thought she would have taken, but she did it because she needed the work and she needed the money. And so... I was so impressed to watch her, how it, 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 was the, it was a solution. She knew how to act on it and she did it. Yeah, and so she didn't, her, allow her, <clears throat> she didn't allow herself to get stuck in the self-pity and things like oh, that. No. And it's just, well, this is what you got to do. No, and yeah. I thought that was wonderful. Oh, yeah. I can get down and as they say, as the British say, I can get down in my cup. <laughs> I've never heard that statement. I had a friend that used to use that. Yeah. And I'd say, what did you say? <laughs> and I thought it's just a really funny statement. But um, so one of the things that you had listed as uh, good things for us to talk about is why it is useful to regularly clear out our hearts, minds, and to do list. Oh, yeah. I'm kind of taking a turn here. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's actually, it's talking about resilience. Mm. Because a lot of times it doesn't happen just by itself. Something that I noticed is that there are a lot of books about how to deal with really big, obvious changes, whether it's a death, a divorce, loss of a job, things that you can tell something happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't see was an acknowledgement of the accumulation of little things. We don't realize that a little bit at a time, things sneak up on us. Mm -hmm. It's promises that we made Uh, years ago. It's projects that we haven't completed. It's stuff that didn't work out the way that we wanted. Mm -hmm. It's even things like clutter, physical clutter stuff. I mean, we talk, we can see the physical clutter. For me, what I find is my physical clutter is actually an external manifestation of my internal clutter. Mm. So I like Mm -hmm. looking at my internal clutter, what is going on in my head that is preventing me from being fully present in this Mm -hmm. moment now. Mm. What I found when I was looking at it is that because it's so gradual, I didn't realize all of the things that were going on inside me. Mm-hmm. And it decided, you know, I need to do something about this. I need to set up 
systems to mm-hmm. regularly assess, okay, what am I holding on to that's actually holding me back? Right. Yeah. Yes. I um, had the experience. I'm in a, a women's club. Yeah. And so we volunteer, you know, for jobs, for having it in our home, the meeting in a home. And I took it because it will force me to clean up my clutter. Okay. I'm a clutter buff. Yeah. And I, I've killed so many trees printing out everything. You know, I don't know. It's just my generation. So anyway. It's not just you. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so anyway, it was so, there is a, a feeling of relief. But there's also a burden I carry when I see all that stuff that I have to go through and all this, I, all this work that I go through. And I think just if you just do this just a little bit every day, yeah. it would be much easier. Life would be and you wouldn't keep, you know, beating yourself over the head saying awful things to yourself. Awful. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And it, it can be hard, mm-hmm. uh, especially when it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, we actually, I can't remember if we got to this last time I was on, we were talking about my book, Rich, uh, talking about uh, navigating life. Mm-hmm. And one of the strategies that is in that book is trying to track your progress. Mm-hmm. Because when you've got all these things that are piled up around you, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> they say that when you're climbing a, a steep cliff or something, don't look down. Yes. For me, it was when you spend the entire day decluttering, don't look at all the stuff you still need to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I've got three more rooms. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, let us celebrate incremental progress. Yeah. Let yeah. us acknowledge ourselves Mm-hmm. because yeah Rome wasn't built in a day and my living room wasn't cleared either so it takes a while well when you ask that question about searching for the answer of what's going on that's allowed the clutter to to yeah. accumulate yeah how does that um how does it play out A lot of times it's not a single answer. Mm -hmm. What I have personally found useful Mm -hmm. is recognizing when there is a disconnect between my physical environment, how I have been acting and who I want to be. The neat thing is when I break it down into those three areas, they actually provide three different approaches of bringing it into alignment. Uh The physical, the decluttering, sometimes that's the easiest. I mean, I spent this morning finally getting rid of all of the recycling stuff that's been piling up, realizing, you know, Yes, it's been segregated, but let's just get it out of the house. Right. (laughs) I have been going through a lot of transitions in my own life now. A lot of things going on where I am stepping into a larger version of my life. Mm. When the the other two legs of the stool, I'm not quite sure how my metaphor is going here, but when you've got the physical environment, you've Mm -hmm. got the... um, who I want to be and you have my actions Mm -hmm. the actions clearing the physical environment helps move me into who I want to be but other things that I can do include fulfilling other commitments taking care of responsibilities the who I want to be, what I want to do to be that, that may include more personal journaling. 
-hmm. tapping into how do I become more congruent with who I want to be. Uh, doing, performing some sort of ritual that helps connect me with who I want to be and to tie back to what we were talking about of letting go of things, having some sort of ritual of letting go of my, my past self mm-hmm. in order to make room for who I am becoming. So, Rachel. So the early part of the year, I went through grieving. First time I'd ever been in this, um, in this type of grieving, actually. And so I just, somebody's, (laughs) somebody suggested that I journal. And so I journal by tap typing. I know some people say there's better to journal in hand, but I seem to enjoy typing more. So I started doing that, started doing some little vignettes and and it's really led me into the possibility of wanting to write more, but I don't have the ritual. I don't have the sit down every day and type 30 minutes, tell your story, (laughs) 30 minutes. And so my question to myself is I enjoy writing, but I don't enjoy making myself sit down and do it. I get rebellious. One of one of my mentors, who is a multi-published writer in in many different uh, genres, Mm -hmm. his suggestion is to write one sentence per day. What? What this does is it creates consistency. Uh It creates momentum. And it helps remove that block of, oh, I have to sit for half an hour. I have to do 500 words. I have to create. You know, do just one sentence. What that does, in addition to developing the habit of writing something every day, is it primes the pump. It helps kind of move things around in the back of your head so that you're thinking of things, whether you're in the shower and something comes to you, it's like, oh, that would be a good sentence to add today. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes to just go with the flow. Mm -hmm. So say for a week, you only write one sentence per day, but each of those sentences have added up to a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And you're getting into the habit of like, okay, well, after I do this, I'll sit down, I'll do my one sentence. And you know, that made me think, I've been thinking about it this past week. I actually wanna write out this section here. Mm -hmm. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. Right. But by only by only having that one sentence, it kind of, there, there's really nothing to rebel against. If you want right. to do more, do more. If you don't, eh, don't, just do the sentence. Yeah. Um, I think it's sometimes hard. Let's say we, I do the one sentence. Yeah. And, and I should get up and walk away knowing I have completed that task. But yeah. inside me, there's this little voice that's going, that's not much, you know, instead of going, I did my chore for today. Yeah, well, it's, it's not a chore. It is a contribution. Okay. Because you are building a castle. Mm -hmm. But the only way that you can build a castle is to lay each brick. Mm -hmm. Something else to keep in mind is that writing is so much more than putting the words to the page. Mm -hmm. Writing is also thinking about stuff. Writing is playing with words. How do you convey 
what is in your heart? Mm -hmm. Writing is realizing that once you put all this stuff out and you, you've typed like five pages and that's not, once you read over it, recognizing, you know, that's close and it gets me in the right direction, but that's not really what I want to say. Oh, yeah. I mean, my my kid, my eldest kid is a writer. They write fiction. Mm -hmm. They're working on like the prequel to the series and they have this whole thing mapped out and they just trashed the first six chapters of the book. Oh. Because it wasn't really what they wanted to write. Uh -huh. And instead of trying to scrunch it around and edit, it's like, no, they just tossed it out and they started over. But because they did that, the, the first attempt, they have a much better sense of what it is they're trying to convey. Mm -hmm. And there are sections from that first, like there are a couple of paragraphs here and there that they absolutely love and right. they fit into what they're writing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. This actually ties into resilience because the most important foundation for resilience is recognizing the danger of expectation. No. Because expectation word again. <laughs> yes, can become calcified yeah. yeah so that you are measuring yourself against an arbitrary expectation it should look like this if it yeah. doesn't then it doesn't count it does not matter yes yeah. writing is a beautiful example of this because so many people look at their writing as like ah i'm no good or any type of art if you look at it and say, it doesn't come out the way I envision it, then I'm going to give up. That right. is the calcification and that kills our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, and this is the true tragedy, live their lives like that. If they try something and it doesn't look the way that it's supposed to look. They don't have the results they expected. Mm -hmm. They think there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. They think they can't do it. And they shrink in on themselves. Right. Resilience is about recognizing that we are works in progress. Mm -hmm. We are going to have results that don't match what we wanted. I can yeah. guarantee that. I mean, it, that's just, that is part of life. Mm -hmm. If we came into life knowing how to do everything perfectly, what would be the point? Mm -hmm. When do you know that you're, <laughs> this may be a silly question, <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. When do you know when you are performing as your expectation? Is that the way I want to say it? Um, I would be happy. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? How do you know Not when you've quite. arrived? Yeah. Well, I think the most basic answer is you never do. You never arrive? Because there's, <laughs> yes, because life is a journey. Mm -hmm. This goes back to what I was saying about celebrating incremental progress. Yes. Because you do arrive at way stations. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times you may not even know, except in retrospect. Mm -hmm. You look back and realize, oh my goodness, I have come so far. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how much I've grown, how much I've accomplished accomplished mm -hmm. right we need to find the balance between planning doing and simply appreciating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we need all three of those to really be alive right 
where it's like, okay, what are we going to do next? Then we do it. And then we say, wow, we did it. But they're staggered. It's more like weaving. Uh, I think, I can't remember, I don't think I shared this story before where again, talking about my eldest who is a writer, they've been a writer for many, 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 many years. They're very good at it. They also want to be an artist. They are not very good at being an artist. Mm -hmm. So what I told them is that I want them to develop a habit of always looking for the next thing that they are going to be absolutely terrible at. Oh, oh the, dear. <laughs> yes, because what that does is it sets up a positive expectation that part of life and the important part of life is the learning. Mm. They yeah. are doing art now. They are doing very, very basic things in order to develop their skills. Mm -hmm. At the point that they're actually pretty happy with their art skills mm -hmm. with the caveat that they're always going to be continuing to improve. Right. But when they feel good about where they are, they want to start to learn how to write music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Knowing that they're probably going to be terrible at it when they Maybe start. Yeah, right. This you... too is resilience. The resilience is about being alive and being uh, part of the process. Okay, I'm thinking here. Okay. My thought left me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I spoke over you and I, I just knocked it right out of your it head. It went away. I'm sorry. It'll come back in its own time. <laughs> so, we can go back to like formal questions if you want it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to go back to uh, the rituals that you have for clearing to help yeah. people get clear about. Yeah, I. They want to go. Yeah, well, I talk, I like talking about um, incorporating rituals into your daily life. Mm -hmm for little things. When I talk about rituals of release, of letting go of things that are not currently supporting you, mm -hmm. the reason there are two reasons why I like framing them as rituals. One of them is because it allows you to focus on what it is that you want to do. Mm -hmm. We have so many things pulling at us all the time, all the things that need to be done, things we said to our friend the other day, and was that really what happened and what are we doing tomorrow? A ritual can create a container where you decide, this is what I am focusing on right now. I will deal with everything else later. And the other thing that I really like about rituals is it helps us connect with a sense of something sacred in the day to day. I love Albert Einstein's quote that there are two ways of looking at the world, either nothing's a miracle or everything is a miracle. Hmm. How do we tap into that sense of childlike wonder that acknowledges how much beauty and magic is in the world around us and can be part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like yeah. that, yeah. that view so much better. So and let me, I, and it, let me put it this way. I could be totally wrong about everything. Nobody know, has like a monopoly on capital T truth. Uh -huh. So I choose to look at the world through the eyes of wonder and appreciation and gratitude. Because mm -hmm. I want yeah. to, 
and it feels good. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> so, um, I mean, as we're, we're talking about <laughs> rituals. <resting. laughs> yeah, um, when a lot of people use the word ritual to mean different things. I use the word ritual when talking about creating these type of containers that have four elements. The first one is creating a sacred space. Some people like to have a physical location with an altar, either things that are special to them, either spiritually or family members or things that just connect them with a sense of something larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary to have a specific place. A sacred space can also be a dedicated place in time. I am setting aside this time for this purpose. Yes. Yeah. And that purpose is the second element of a ritual. What is your intention? What is that you want to let go of? What do you want to happen? How do you want to have changed as a result of performing this ritual. Mm -hmm. The third aspect is a physical action. This is what changes it from just thinking about stuff into a transformative ritual. Right. This could be writing a letter and tearing it up. This could be dancing. This could be playing music. It could even be something like going for a meditative walk to your favorite tree and grounding yourself by touching the bark. Mm. Mm -hmm. Each of these is a physical activity that can embody what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And the fourth element of a ritual is deliberately closing it. I like using gratitude, oh. appreciation, and acknowledgement for having had this experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's gratitude for the thing that you're letting go of. Mm -hmm. What closing the ritual does is it acts as kind of an airlock to help you transition back into the real world and all these other things that are being thrown at you and tugging at you and all these sort of things mm -hmm. by creating this container that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, mm -hmm. it makes it easier not just to mentally focus on what it is that you're doing, but emotionally allow yourself the experience. Our hearts are very tender, mm -hmm. and it can be scary to let them out in the outside world because there is so much bombarding us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we create a container and tell our hearts, it's okay, we are in this safe space. You can come out now. It makes it so much easier to connect with your heart space, to identify who are you really because you are committing to keeping those tender parts of yourself safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you can tuck them back in, close out the ritual and move out into the, the regular world as it were. Mm -hmm. Okay, so take me through that process, just thinking it. I know you've talked us through this. Yeah. But can you just take me through it? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um, an example that I like using because, because it is something that people do not associate with rituals is my daily to-do lists. Mm -hmm. The way that I transform it into a ritual is at the end of the day, I open up my date book. I have, this is my sacred space while I'm doing this. 
this is I have my date book that I love. It's one of the eight by 10 big things. And uh, I have my colored markers and my pencil and my all these sort of things. And I, it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. I have already mapped out, here are the things that I want to accomplish this week. Mm -hmm. I'd previously broken it down where I have, I have, okay, this is what I want to do this month, each week on Sunday, I say, this is what I want to do this week, both mm -hmm. personal and professional. Mm -hmm. And then in that evening time, I sit with it and I look at my lists and I, after I've done all the head work of what needs to be done, I tap into my heart and I ask, what is it? that is most important for me to do tomorrow that is sustainable, that moves me forward, that makes sure that I am moving forward in all these various endeavors in my life mm -hmm. without overwhelming me. If I only listen to my head, I would have a to-do list a mile long that I could never do. And it would be easy to forget to build in the spaciousness mm -hmm. that allows me to spend time with my family. Yeah. To build in that time to go for a walk and look at the sky. Mm -hmm. right. So I'll touch into my heart. The physical action is writing it out. Here is my to-do list. It's like, here's the, the crossing off the things from the current day, make right. sure, okay, yeah. I did get things done. I have my tracking logs. I've mentioned uh, the important for that, especially that incremental progress. Mm -hmm. I have my color coded, okay, did I go for my walk today? And these are all part of my ritual which not only keep track of all the things that I've done, but it helps me feel like I'm in control of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At least those elements that I am tracking that I can do something about. Mm -hmm. Did I go for an afternoon walk and do that kind of reset because I know that my energy dips in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. Did I... Um, with the, the nourishment that I put into my body, did I fulfill my commitments to myself? Mm -hmm. So I, I'll, I'll go through it. Let me just co complete the ritual. Mm -hmm. I'll go through and do all these things. And those are my physical activities is the tracking and the marking. Mm -hmm. And the closure is closing my book and putting away my things and setting aside the day so that now I can transition into spending time with my husband, mm -hmm. into getting ready for sleep, into something else. Now that I have both literally and figuratively closed out the ritual of right. figuring out my next day. Yeah. Um, what do you do when you haven't, when you've overbooked yourself and is it just the matter of accepting that you overbooked yourself and so you can put it on tomorrow's schedule? Is that a, a way of not forgiving, well, but releasing? That can be an element of it. Mm -hmm. The questions that I have would be, what is truly important? Mm -hmm. There are some things that, yeah, they need to be done. I'll put them on the, the next day's list. Mm -hmm. I need to be honest with myself because there are times where I just make, add something to the next day's list over and over and over again. Oh, and yes. each time I do that, uh -huh. it breaks trust with myself. Oh. Mm -hmm because it's always there, I never do it, and I get into the habit of just not doing it. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. may be there comes a time where I have to either say, no, this is the first thing I do that day, mm -hmm. or I take it off my to-do list. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will schedule it. That's actually something I talk about um, 
in rituals of release, one of the things to release are things that are not now. Because you can have like, here are all my projects, here are all the things that I want to do, but you can only do things one at a time. There's only so much time in the day. Mm -hmm. So you may need to schedule and say, I am not going to have time to do this one thing do, 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 for another six weeks. Oh. Therefore, I'm going to flip my calendar six weeks down the line and I will say, okay, I will take care of it six weeks down the line mm -hmm. and I will completely take it off my next day, next day, next day, next day. And right. that can be part of the ritual as well. Going inside and figuring out what do I really need to do now and what is it beneficial to schedule for later? Right. Because it's just cluttering up my now, so I can't get my now done. Right. <laughs> yes. I have a tendency sometimes of overbooking myself. Yeah. I, I, I'm the only one that does that, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do, um, sometimes I don't even realize the stress that it's putting me under. Yeah. You know, just in trying to do it. And in this year, I've really kind of had to learn to say, cat frog, I can't yeah. do it. Yeah. And it's like getting out of that course, you know, yeah. not now. Yeah. And just allowing yourself to, to really accept, I think, that it was yeah. just an over, over aggressive approach. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's a perfect example of how these little things can gang up on you. Because right. I'm sure when you first started booking things, it did not feel overwhelming. No, but it was the stacking upon stacking upon stacking. And you look around and realize, oh my God, I need to pee. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you don't have any room. Right. Right. I mean, when Sometimes I, when I, yeah. Sometimes in this case, I actually thought it would work. I thought I had worked out the schedules, but I terribly underestimated the the progress this course was going to demand. Yeah, for me to keep up, and it, it just wasn't going to work. It just yeah, not with me. I mean, with my schedule and what I was doing. So well, one of the yeah the. Um... I talk in my book, I talk about types of things that you can let go of that add to this. Uh -huh. One of the things is releasing what no longer serves you. Yes. The, this one can be challenging because there are certain things that have gotten us to this point that were really useful and it's hard to let go because they've been really useful. Yes. I think the course might fit in there this as well because it seems like it would be really useful. Uh -huh. But at this point in time, it's not supporting your life as a whole. Right. Some things yeah. have a shelf life. Right. Some things you need to really acknowledge and appreciate that support and then let them go again to make room for what's next i think one of the hardest things for many people and a lot of people don't even address this is allowing those friendships that used to be intense really close friends yeah. from high school and then all of a sudden you're not that you're yeah. just two people hanging out together and yeah. not really enjoying the time so yeah. it's like allowing some friendships to stop almost. That, that sounds like something that would be ripe for a ritual. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of grief there for what is gone. True. But it also almost, I don't know that it, it requires, but it almost like if, it, if the relationship were that deep, it deserves acknowledgement of all the wonderful ways that it has impacted your life. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
right set aside a time mm -hmm. and say you know i'm going to uh find some pictures <laughs> of memories with this person yes. maybe create a scrapbook maybe digital maybe just a, a few loose things maybe just going through things on your phone mm -hmm. maybe go through some like old emails or something from them and really sink into and appreciate how amazing this connection was mm -hmm. and how grateful you were for the impact it had on your life. Mm -hmm. Because if it were that intense and that connected, this person has forever changed who you are. Mm -hmm. Such that regardless of what type of connection you may, the two of you may have in this moment, they will always be part of you. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that can change that. Um, I just decided to go through the family pictures, oh. giving my son his, my daughter yeah. hers, and keeping some of those for myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was prolific in taking pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was yeah, the camera true. day, and now we're even worse with the phone. Oh, yeah. But, <clears throat> but instead of being sad i looked back and saw smiling touching it was so positive for me oh yes and really i had a pretty good marriage in the beginning <laughs> yes it was a wonderful marriage yeah. in in the way that it played out the things that we did in the young children growing and it was I was very happy then. Yeah. And then as the relation changed and things changed, it wasn't the same sharing. Yeah. It wasn't the same. But it was a wonderful lesson to me that we yeah. can go back and enjoy the happiness of our past. Oh, you know? yes. Yeah. I mean, marriages are also so prone to expectations. Mm, yes, especially yeah. the expectation that it will last forever yes oh yes <laughs> I, mean, I mean i talk about my gratitude for my first marriage yeah and the fact that we did become we became much better friends mm -hmm. after we decided we were not supposed to be married to each other Right. because we were no longer disappointed that the <laughs> other person was not the person we wanted to be married to yeah yeah it was yeah it's really a good thing yeah i enjoyed that little trip yeah actually i still have a few more boxes to go through <laughs> yeah so i'm going to keep on with this <laughs> yeah well you know what we're approaching the end of this wonderful time together yeah. I, it's always, Rachel, it's always just a, a beautiful journey when I'm visiting with you, sharing with you. Um, there's insights all the time. And, uh, but you are, you are giving the listeners a walking meditation. Yeah, this right? was, this, this is another one of those things that I created for myself uh -huh. because I love the idea of meditation and kind of reconnecting and uh but i'm also one of those people that i get antsy sitting still yes. i'm i'm thinking about my grocery list or whatever and it just wasn't working for me but i love going for walks uh -huh. so what i did is i created this 10 minute meditation to listen to while you're going for a walk mm -hmm. with all the caveats, please do so safely. Don't use this at night. Don't yeah. run into like a, don't walk into traffic, that sort of thing. Yeah. But the purpose of it is to help you connect. It, it's called reconnect with now mm -hmm. so that you, like it's that. an embodiment. You can let go of all the, the chatter and the thoughts and things like that and really become present now uh -huh. yeah yeah so um 
listeners, you can go to www.thefullnessofyourpower.com slash reconnect hyphen with hyphen now. Yeah. Correct? Yes. The fullness of your power dot com slash reconnect hyphen with hyphen now. Okay. Yes, that's wonderful. I think to me that sounds so exciting and fun to do. Something oh. I'd, I'd like to point out a lot of times when people give away free gifts, it's mm -hmm. you give an email address and then they give you the gift. Mine's a little bit different in that. I will give you, uh, I mean, if you, if you just go to there, you can just download the, the meditation. And I do have a mailing list where I send out stuff that I think is cool. Uh, like I, I come up with this neat idea. I was like, oh, I found this really helpful. Let me share it with my community. <laughs> and I do invite you. It's like, hey, if you want to get this, sign up for my list. Yes. But it's not a requirement for getting the, the meditation. Yes, yes. Well, I'm going to do this. I don't think I did it last time. I probably liked it. Was it offered last time? Uh, actually, I just created this last month. So this is new. Oh, my oh, oh, yeah. goodness. Well, I think it's a good thing to do. Now, you know, I always like to ask my questions. I have a couple questions. Yeah. That, you know, since a, you're a woman who's been doing this since she was nine years old. Traveling in various degrees <laughs> <laughs> i had no clients when i was nine i will just no, say that no. <laughs> <laughs> they came 11 yeah I think yeah i had i had a, a few a few classmates i may have helped but yeah i probably wasn't very good at it so right. so this is the first one <clears throat> what is the most important action needed to face the fear of transition um How did you phrase the question again? The most what important thing to face? I said action. The action. Most important most, action, action needed to face, face the fear of transition. The most important action mm -hmm. is to allow yourself to be sad. Sad. A lot of time, and I'm talking about those transitions that um well sometimes there are plans sometimes they're not mm -hmm. but in order to move into something new something else first has to end yeah a lot of people try to push through into the new thing and they ignore the fact that there was a loss you're right mm -hmm. notice i i did not say um you have to spend a lot of time being miserable. No. <laughs> what I said was allow yourself to be sad. If something comes up, don't try to shove it down. Don't try to pretend it doesn't exist. Give yourself that room to just be with it and acknowledge, yeah, I'm disappointed. Yeah. I'm sad. And let it flow through you when you do that a lot of times it just passes through and then you come back to neutral it's like okay i have honored that loss mm -hmm. and now at my core i feel more prepared to move forward mm. yeah yeah and really that time of um finding your footage and, or accepting the situation yeah um has no time limit i mean oh, we're yeah. all so unique oh yeah some people and it comes and goes oh that's there may true. be there may be some aspect of it that you didn't realize was attached to something that happened in the past mm -hmm. uh if it's something like grief all of the studies that show how strongly our sense of smell is attached to memories. Oh. Where you walk into a bakery and all of a sudden there's something about it and you're nine years old again. Yeah. In your grandma's kitchen. 
Yes. Those type of, or, or a situation comes up that you didn't realize you had some sort of story attached to it that was based on an old premise. Yeah. That is no longer part of your new life. But on a conscious level, you had no idea that you even had this assumption until it pops up 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Life is not linear, even though we try to live it that way. So, so allow yourself those pop-ups as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. It happens. Yeah. Yeah. It'll come, it'll go, and you move on. Yes. Yes. Um, and then this, the next one is interesting. I'm taking a survey. I'm <laughs> yeah. About how people answer this one, but what is your greatest success this star in your life? Well, my, it, it's difficult because my greatest success is a work in progress. It's ah. who I am becoming. Because when I, the, the ones that come to mind, it's my, my marriage and my family. Mm -hmm. Yes. The reason I rated a success is I look at where I was 15 years ago and oh my goodness, I am glad I've moved on from there. Yes. And yet I still see how much more I am becoming. Mm -hmm. uh, my kids are seniors in high school. They are preparing for that transition into adulthood. Right. My role as a parent is changing. My role as a wife, as I've been, as my husband's been going through a lot of transitions, that's been mm -hmm. changing. Mm -hmm. And he has been so amazing in helping me become more of who I want to be. Right. And it's an ongoing. It really is. And I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll look back on myself now and go, mm, yeah, I'm glad I've grown from that. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, yeah, I'm, it fills my heart. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you know, the, the hour is up. And so I may, we may have just tweaked over a little bit. <laughs> But anyway, it's always a pleasure to have you with me, Rachel. Oh, this has been lovely. I enjoy our conversation. I know. We'll have to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you saying that before. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I thank you very much for your words of wisdom today um, and all the lessons we've learned. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. I do want each of you to go for the walking meditation. That Rachel has created just recently yeah. and use it so that you can become more grounded and, and really have that space that you need in your daily lives. So thank you, Rachel. You are so very welcome. Yes. And to those out there listening, I so appreciate that you are, have spent time with us today. Um, it's always my pleasure to know that you're out there and I look forward to seeing you next week. Now, I have no assignment other than this magnificent meditation, walking meditation, mm -hmm. and just be sure that you share this program with a friend. So have a great week. You can make a difference. Thank you for being here. Joyce Buford returns next week at the same time for another edition of Second Wind. Through the Joyce Buford Empowerment System, women are receiving the support they need through their transitions and are able to reclaim their true purpose with confidence. They receive the tools they need to map out new lives. You can find out more about her coaching services at JoyceBufordEmpowers.com.